Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to our live talk on surgery of the hand, wrist, and forearm. Before we begin, I'd like to ask that you keep yourself muted, and throughout the presentation, you submit questions via Zoom. At the conclusion of the presentation, I'll read these questions off to Dr. Fahey and give him a chance to answer them. A quick introduction of OrthoSouth. OrthoSouth has seven clinic locations across the Mid-South region, and we have two surgery centers, one in Germantown and one in South Haven. All righty, now Dr. Fahey has elected to introduce himself, so I'm gonna pass it off. Go ahead, Dr. Fahey. Hi, well, thank you, Savannah. Uh, hi, everybody, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Christian Fahey. I'm an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in surgery of the hand at uh, OrthoSouth. Um, I work out of the Germantown location, the Bartlett location, and the East Memphis one by Laurelwood. I've been working for OrthoSouth and its predecessors since 2004. Um, before I lived here, I'm, I'm from New Jersey. Uh, I trained at the Philadelphia Hand Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and so I've been living amongst you all for the past uh, 18 years, uh, almost 19 now. Um, and so uh, hopefully this will go well. Um, uh, I think that there's a few things about me that are a little different. Uh, I do think that that kind of sort of determines how I live and how I, how I work. So I think it's for worth a second talking about me as a person. Um, this is a drawing you can see on your screen. It's a drawing one of my employees made of all of us doctors, me in particular, uh, about 10 years ago. And while I don't have the hair anymore, um, I think it does kind of summarize my personality pretty well. Um, one of my things that makes me who I am is I'm the third of six children. I'm the middle one. Uh, and so, you know, the middle one always has to kind of work harder um, and, and scrap. Uh, and that's me. That's what I've always done. Um, at the same point, he has to be able to live with and work with others. Uh, and also, I, I think that that is one of my slightly unusual skills that I think I, I'm much better in fitting in both with patients and with other doctors and with other workers, uh, healthcare workers, than a lot of other people that I've interacted with. And I think it's to my benefit as a doctor. And, you know, so therefore, at least directly to the benefit of my patients, um, that I can, I can do that and I always have um, uh, that's a more modern picture of me in the operating room, which is, you know, a third of my life. Um, I, I do believe in learning always. I'm always open to learning something either from, you know, other doctors or patients. Uh, just today, a patient taught me something. Um, at the same point, I, I like new technology and I'm always very much interested in when something gets improved, but still someone has to prove to me that it's improved. Uh, cause there's a lot of fly by night things that happen. Um, and so I, I'm not an early adopter, uh, of new technology. Uh, I, I always want someone else to adopt it first and to show me that it works, uh, before I do it. That being said, you know, that takes a little bit of time to, to let, let that go through. Um, but I do do things quote the new way, as well as things, the ways that's tried and true. Um, also, I have a whole theory of medicine, and I think that the first and foremost thing you have to do is you have to respect your patients. You have to listen to your patients. You know, I'm, I'm not some guy on high talking down to people. Um, and so I, I always let patients tell me what they want to tell me, and, and I listen and try to put it together. Uh, I also try to get my, to know my patients as people. So, you know, sometimes it's for a reason that has to do with your health or with your injury, and sometimes it's just because I want to know you. Um, you know, so for example, if you, I always want to know what your job is, if you're working, uh, because if we're going to do something with a hand injury or a hand condition, I need to be able to answer your questions about things like, when can I go back to work? You know, what can I expect and how much help am I going to need at home? Uh, so I will always delve into those kind of topics, uh, before I give you a suggestion as to what the plan should be. Also, you know, people are different. Um, and so I can't treat two very different people in the same way. I have to think about them as a person. I have to think about what their understanding is, you know, what their ability to listen is, what their ability to understand is. Um, and so I'm always trying to meet people where they are rather than making them come to me. Um, I have to think about their whole life, their whole person. You know, they're not a broken wrist. They're a person with a broken wrist. And that person has a husband and a wife or one or the other. <laughs> 
and children and a job and expectations and hopes and mortgages and car payments. Um, so I, I always try to think about those things and tailor my rec recommendations and my procedures to those things. I also will give people pretty much all the options, always. And for some people, that's a little bit confusing. Um, but I'll give them the options. And I'll explain to them why I think that's a good option or that's a bad option. It's kind of rare for me to tell somebody, this is what you should do. Uh, but there are some circumstances where I know that which it's always your job to decide if you want to do what I think is right. And it's always your option to tell me if you don't want to do that. Uh, and if you're making a horrible mistake, I'll tell you, I think you're making a horrible mistake, but it's your body. Uh, it's your life. Um, I just got a message. My internet connection is going down. I don't know why. If anybody has a problem, let us know. And I, I can always log back off and log back on. Anyway, um, and then once I've made a recommendation and, and thought about you as a whole person, I always have to uh, be the one who does the things. You know, I have to be, have the skill set and the knowledge set to do that. Um, I can't be afraid of people asking me questions. I can't be afraid of doing things, um, and I'm not. Um, and lastly, I think in summary, patients are in charge. You know, I, I'm the informed advisor and the informed doer, but patients are in charge. Um, let me go back a couple slides. Uh, I want to acknowledge the fact that, that before I've made this presentation, I have several partners who have made some really good presentations. Um, and so I think it, it'll be worthwhile to refer to them. Um, and I might skip a few things because I don't want to be too redundant. For example, Jeff Call did a great presentation uh, six or nine months ago, and he went over all the common things. Um, and many of you may have seen that. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to be totally repetitive. At the same point, I'm going to talk about some of the things he talked about because I'm going to put a slightly different spin on them. Uh, there are some things that he and I don't exactly agree 100 percent on. Uh, and diagnose a treatment. And that's because we're different people. We train at different places and God has not given us an owner's manual. Um, so I'm not going to ever say that he's right, he's wrong and I'm right or the other opposite, but I'm going to say, here's what I think and here's why I think it. Uh, Tyler Cannon also uh, is an associate. He gave a great presentation a couple of months ago. And lastly, Michael Neal is another one of the doctors in the group. Mike's a really smart guy. Mike's a great guy. And Mike's presentation, I think, is very interesting in a couple of fashions. The first one is, you know, he talked about that thing which we doctors tend not to talk about, and that's diet, diet and health issues. Uh, I think it is true. You are what you what you eat, um, and we're learning more and more things about the consequence of health. Um, and people may say, "Well, I have carpal tunnel. What does it have to do with what I help, what I eat?" Well, you know, if you eat poorly, you're not going to heal your wound. You're going to have an ugly, nasty, painful scar, uh, and the number one cause of carpal tunnel, for example, is your sugars being too high. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge those things. Anyway, those are all great videos if you care to go back in the library and watch them. So first things, uh, I'll talk about a few new things. I'll talk about a few old things, and then I will summarize some differences in opinions. So one thing that Dr. Cole was short on um, was Dupuytren's contracture. Nice little picture. Dupuytren's contracture is a genetic disorder. You inherited it if you have it. Um, it seems to have come in from the area of Scandinavia. Uh, very common in people of Viking descent. Very common in northern northern uh, Scotland, northern Ireland, northern England, northern France, Germany, Denmark, uh, Russia, Poland, um, and it's actually an abnormality in the genes for your fat cells. Believe it or not. But it's a gene that's only expressed in three locations in the body. Uh, it's only expressed in the palm, in the base of your foot, and in the male genitalia. Um, it turns on your body's system of healing wounds. And so you make a bunch of scar tissue, which starts out as balls. And then over time, the balls connect into a little, like a little pearl chains. And then over time, those pearl chains tighten into a band. And then the band starts to pull on your finger and it progressively pulls your fingers down. Most common in your pinky, second most common in your ring. Over time, it will pull those fingers down to the point where they'll actually end up like this if you live long enough. How long? It depends on you. It's, it's a very unique thing, how long it will take to progress. Everyone seems to be a little bit different. There are a few things that are known to worsen it, to make it happen more rapidly and therefore not doing those things uh, seems to make it progress more slowly. But other than that, we don't really have a cure.
cure for a treatment that doesn't involve surgery. Uh, there are risks to the surgery. So generally speaking, we tell people when they come in with it and it's relatively mild that you should do nothing until it reaches a high enough level of severity that it is then worth the risks of treatment. And to summarize that in a very easy to understand way, there's a thing called the tabletop test where you literally try to put your hand down on the table. If you can get your hand on the table, you don't need surgery. If on the other hand, you're like this and your hands up off the table, then you probably need surgery and you should definitely come in and we should talk about it. Um, numerically, we put a number to it. We say if there's a 30 degree contracture, uh, then, you, then you probably should have an intervention. Um, we do know that smoking makes it worse. We know, do know that diabetes makes it worse. We do know that alcohol makes it worse, more than two a day. Uh, so we recommend people who have it, who don't want surgery, who are still relatively mild to minimize the nicotine, minimize the alcohol, uh, minimize the, the um, tobacco. Tobacco, we think any tobacco is bad. Alcohol, we think it's two a day. Diabetes, we go by the, the definition of diabetes, which right now has changed. It's currently defined as 180, if memory serves. Um, we know that the younger you are when you first get it, the more rapidly it progresses later on, and the more likely it is to come back early after any intervention you do. Uh, so we don't like seeing a 32-year-old who has Dupuytrens already, because we know that person is going to have multiple surgeries during their life. It's going to recur quickly, no matter what we do, almost no matter what we do. Um, it does progressively worsen as these, shoulder, these pictures show. Um, this talks about the 30 degrees in the tabletop. Some people come in and say, I've been stretching it, I've been doing therapy, and that's actually a mistake. Uh, that seems to make it worse. You know, the metaphor that I use is it pisses it off. So leave it alone, just live with it, don't piss it off. Use your hand to the best of your ability. Um, and we will go from there. Um, there are three interventions that we do. I use the word surgery and that's really a colloquialism. There's really three options, only one of which is surgery. The traditional one is surgery. Uh, surgery involves taking the abnormal structure out. Um, and if you wanna do the operation correctly, which I do, you wanna take all of the abnormal structure out. If you leave a little bit of it, it comes back faster. And that involves working in three dimensions. So the traditional easy way to do it is just make a small incision in the palm, take the little band that's sticking up under the palm and cut it. People will, will move much better. The problem with that is you've left the structure in there. It's gonna come back fast if you do that. Plus also when you make a small incision, you can't see the deep structures. Uh, so I think a small incision is a bad idea. Uh, I think you, you, if you're going to do surgery, you want to do the surgery right, and you want to get the structure out. Okay. The biggest downside of doing the surgery is that it leads to a lot of pain, a lot of swelling, a lot of stiffness, a lot of need for rehab. Uh, so we've been looking for alternatives for years. And I say, when I say we, I mean my predecessors. Uh, and so there was one in, alternative that was worked out about 15 years ago. There's an enzyme that comes from the botulism germ, like Botox, but not Botox. Uh, and that germ takes collagen and just dissolves it, turns it into mush. And the metaphor is you're putting acid in pain. Uh, it just dissolves it away. You put little drops in there and it dissolves everything it touches that's made out of collagen within the range of that little drop. Um, the problem with it, I use it. Uh, I use it a lot a couple of years ago. I don't use it so much anymore. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble with the company because I'm on the list of people who are certified to use it and approved to use it, and they send me patients. Uh, however, the problem with it, number one, it's very expensive. The average person needs two doses. It's $1,400 a dose. It has a shelf life while it's on dry ice of two weeks. It has a shelf life once you've taken it off ice and it's defrosted of 15 minutes. You can't shake it. You have to stir it very carefully or else it doesn't work. Uh, and so when we do it, we have to very carefully coordinate. We have to order it. The patient's got to be ready to come in. They've got to come in within a day or two of FedEx coming. Uh, we have to know when they're coming so we can take it off the dry ice so it can defrost. And we have to not be behind schedule. They have to not be on schedule. You got to be real careful not to drop it or shake it up too rough. Um, and then, like I said, you often have to do more than one. Also, your immune system really doesn't like that stuff. The immune system has experienced botulism before because botulism germs surround us. We're almost swimming in it. Uh, and so your body uh, knows that it needs to fight off botulism, no matter what. Uh, and so for about a day, your immune system goes into high gear. 
And it can even be kind of scary to look at you. Sometimes your whole arm swells up like someone beat you with a baseball bat from us putting two drops in. And then the next day, just like that, it's gone. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing. And then the following day, the structure we put the little drop of acid on, it just pops, just gives up the ghost. Uh, the other problem with it is that is a short-term solution. It comes back on average a little less than three years, two and a half is closer. Um, so when we had no alternatives, I was a big user of that stuff. Um, it's actually very common in French, this, this disease. And the French, they have a pretty evolved healthcare system, uh, although they try to save money. So at the same time, we Americans were working on a solution, so were the French. And they came up with a different solution, which is pretty interesting. We use this $1,400 times two, so $2,800 chemical. And they take a $1 needle and they, with the needle, they punch a bunch of holes, about a thousand holes in the structure. And after you punch a bunch of holes with it, with the needle, it pops and it tears. At first, we Americans laughed at the French. And then there was one American in particular uh, who went over to France to learn how to, how to do it. And he came back and he started doing it in, in Miami or Southern Florida. And again, we all thought he was a little bit nuts. Um, and he is a good doctor and a good scientist. So he did a bunch of studies and he showed definitively it works every bit as well as the enzyme. And it costs, the cost of doing the procedure is a dollar, uh, not 2,800. Um, the recurrence rate is about the same. The outcome is slightly superior with the needle than with the, with the injection. Uh, it does recur in about three years versus less than three years for the enzyme. Um, and it is not anywhere near as painful. It is not anywhere near as swelling. And most people don't need any therapy at all. Very interestingly, one of the first doctors in the country to do it, who went to learn, down to Miami to learn how to do it, was Dr. Bill Borland, one of our recently deceased doctors at, at uh, Ortho South. He was a great doctor and a great person. We all miss him. Um, he really taught a lot of us how to do a lot of things. But anyway, he taught me how to do this about a decade ago. Um, and so I, I do between two and four a week, every week. Uh, and I've been doing that for a while. Um, I think the results are good. I say good because they're not as good as open. Open, you get a better release. You get a longer time without the problem. But re an average recovery of two days versus an average recovery of two months, average recovery of no therapy versus an average recovery of 12 sessions of therapy. Uh, for the more mild cases, I think it's the way to go. So I kind of nowadays like to have someone come in who's got a 30 or 40 deep contracture that only involves one knuckle. Uh, and I say, you know what, we can almost certainly make this radically better if you just lay there and give me five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes uh, to work on you. Uh, I think you'll be fine. All right. And I go into more detail, of course. Um, I don't do the surgery the same day I meet people or the procedure because I really think that they need to think about it. I make them go home and think about it. And also because uh, it is somewhere between five to half an hour procedure, five minutes to half an hour. So I don't wanna rush through it. Uh, so I had to come back another day when it's, that's the only thing that I'm doing is, is the couple of percutaneous releases. Uh, so normally I'll meet you at like 11 or 12 in the morning um, and we'll just spend whatever time we need doing it. One of the risks to any treatment of this is that Normally, the structure before it contracts is actually spiraling from your skin down to your bone. And as it spirals, it spirals around things. And one of the things that it spirals around is your nerves. As it contracts, that spiral becomes straight. And the nerve that was going straight before is now a spiral around the structure. And this structure and a nerve, they look the same. Um, so you can't tell by looking at it whether that thing you're about to cut is the band or a nerve. You either have to know where the nerve is or you have to find the nerve on the two ends and work your way into the middle. When we do surgery, that's what we do. We find the nerve on this end, we find the nerve on that end. We trace it towards the middle and we take the band out as we work towards the middle. Uh, for the needle, you can't do that. So for the needle, uh, there's a few other things you can do. One of which is if you tap the nerve, you'll get a shock. So I'll just sit there and I'll tap you for a little while. And I'll say, tell me if you get any shocks and I'll know to avoid those areas. The other part is just knowing the anatomy. Um, so there is a risk to the nerve. And because of that, one of the tricks that Dr. Eaton and Dr. Borland worked out is while we want to make it numb, we don't want to make it too numb. If we make it too numb, you can't tell me if I'm touching the nerve. If I make it a little bit numb, so you don't really feel the needle in the skin, but you still feel the nerve, you'll know it if I touch your nerve. You'll get a very distinct electrical shock. 
Touching the nerve once is okay. It'll recover from that. Touching the nerve twice, probably not okay. Touching the nerve 14 times, not okay. That nerve won't come back. Um, so it, it's one of those things that we have to work together. We have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to tell me what you're feeling in detail uh, and not just kind of sort of throw things out like, oh, that's the nerve. Oh, that's the nerve. I've had a couple of patients who, who I, I realize after I do it or as I'm doing it that they can't communicate with me, in which case I just stop. You know, it's better to have someone be upset than it is to cut someone's nerve by mistake. I do that every once in a while. Um, overall, the result is actually quite good. Um, people, it comes back in about three years and we do it again. Okay. Now, when it's a more severe case, then we're talking about a surgery. Um, I, I do less than half as many of those as I did before the needle release came out. More than half of these cases nowadays are needle. Um, I do the surgery. It requires a long dissection, a long time, and we just have to pick it off the nerve. Sometimes I can do that operation in an hour, 40 minutes. Sometimes it takes me three hours. It takes as long as it needs to take because I just have to pick that stuff off the nerve and preserve your nerve. So again, I wanted to go in more detail than what Dr. Cole mentioned. Um, wrist sprains. Wrist sprains run, run a whole panoply of different things that it can be. It's a simple term, but it's, it's not a simple problem. Uh, it's a collection of at least 10 different, op, 10 different injuries. People sometimes say to me, well, you know, why is this so complicated? Why can't you fix this? The doctor fixed my ACL. And you have to kind of smile and realize that in the knee, there is three bones and four ligaments. That's it. Uh, so there's not all that much to understand. In the wrist, depending on how you count, there's either eight bones or 15 bones. Um, and there's at least 20 ligaments. And depending on how you define a ligament and how you count a ligament, there's up to 37, okay, 37 versus four. So we're not even talking about an order of magnitude more, more complex. We're talking about two to three orders of magnitude more complex than the knee. Um, and it's to a certain degree an unsolved problem. There's a lot of wrist sprains that we can't make perfect, but there are some that we can. And there's many that we can make dramatically better. Um, so that's the situation. Um, there's one in particular that's pretty interesting. There are two bones in your wrist. I think my pointer works. This one right here that I'm pointing at, if you can see that, if you can't see it, it's the bone right in the middle. It's called the lunate. It's called that because when you view it from the side, it looks like the moon. Um, and then over here, this bone right here, which is the bone near the base of the thumb is called the scaphoid. And so there's a ligament that connects the two of them called the scapholunate interosseous, which means two bones, means between two bones, ligament, the SLIL. It is the single most common ligament in the wrist. Um, and probably the reason why it is, is because those 37 ligaments, they all help each other out. There's more than one ligament to do basically every job, except for this job. This ligament works entirely on its own. And so when it's injured, there's nothing helping out. Uh, when it's injured, those two bones tend to spread apart. And as they spread apart, not only do they go apart like this, they also twist like this. Um, and one of the two bones, the scaphoid bone, it forms the cornerstone of the wrist. It holds everything else in the proper position. So as it moves, everything else moves with it. And over time, that causes real problems. Uh, everything in the wrist bangs against each other every time you move your wrist. And over time, you get a terrible post-traumatic arthritis. It takes between 10 to 20 years for that to happen. This injury of this is very common. I would bet you that if you're a guy who played on a football team, at least one of your teammates would, did this every year. Um, and it happens for other reasons too. You can just fall. Most common single thing is falling. Some people are trying to pick up a power tool. And picking up the power tool, you know, it turns on and it kicks them. Um, but those two bones spread apart. And over time, it causes a predictable pattern of post-traumatic arthritis. Meanwhile, the injury itself, it hurts, but not bad. And if you're, you know, a quote, tough guy, uh, you can ignore it. You can live with it. You shouldn't. Uh, because the, the sooner we fix that thing, the better the result is. Um, when we fix it, if we get to it early, we can get a good result. If we get to it late, not so much. Um, there's lots of other kinds of wrist injuries um, and most of them are not entirely predictable on their progression, but a scaphoid interosseous ligament rupture is predictable on what it will do. Uh, there's even a name for it. It's an acronym, SLAC, scaphoid advanced collapse. 
as you go through time, everything collapses around it and the two bones separate. This is a picture of an early scaphoid advanced collapse where these two bones are too far apart. See, they should, all these bones should be equally far apart. And then the bone that's over by the base of the thumb called the scaphoid, if you look at it and use your imagination, it kind of looks like a wedding ring or a college ring. And that's called a signet ring sign. It's not supposed to look like that. It's like that because it's rotating in the third dimension. So as it rotates, it looks like a ring when it's in the position it's supposed to be, it looks like a kidney bean. Um, so back to wrist pains in general, simple brace is the most common early treatment because when it's one of the 37 ligaments, it has a helper. If you give it a break, there's a very good chance it'll heal six to 12 weeks, generally speaking. Uh, so you modify your activity, you wear a brace. There are pills that one can take. Um, I personally don't use as many pills as I used to. We've learned a lesson, I think, in the past 20 years uh, about dangers of pain pills in particular and pills in general. You know, all kinds of bad things have happened and come, come to light. Uh, so I still use them, but I, I, I don't reach for them first thing. I always talk to people about the safest options. Um, so anyway, medications are an option. Um, therapy is sometimes helpful. There are a few different kinds of wrist sprains that therapy really does help with. If all that fails and you've been given a proper opportunity to heal and you're still having problems, steroid injections are often helpful. Steroids work by decreasing your body's ability to swell. It's what they do. Whether you take them as a pill or take them as a shot, no matter how you take them, what they're doing is decreasing your body's ability to swell. And by decreasing your body's ability to swell, they decrease pain most of the time, particularly if swelling is a component of the pain. And in the wrist, it's or really in the orthopedics. It usually is. Usually there's some underlying problem. That underlying problem is irritating a structure. That structure is swelling because of the irritation. So with ligament sprain, the bones are moving in ways they're not supposed to. They're banging against each other. That makes swelling. So the steroid shot decreases the swelling, decreases the pain. It doesn't cure the problem. Uh, sometimes it is the right choice to make. Like someone's got a problem, they need surgery, but they can't have surgery now. They, you know, they have a car payment coming up or their wife is sick or you know, they need to keep on working. And so a steroid shot will get you a couple months, maybe even a couple of years. And there are a couple of tears that all you need is a steroid shot. You just need to get rid of the swelling and it will heal on its own. Um, the next option for wrist sprains, if this stuff doesn't work adequately, is some of them can be re repaired. Some of them can't be repaired. They have to be reconstructed, which means build a new one, build a new one out of something else. For example, the ACL can't be repaired. No one in the past 50 years in the world has had an ACL repair. They might use that what they've had as a reconstruction. A new ACL gets built. And similarly, there, there is some reconstruction of some of the ligaments of the wrist. And lastly, there is an operation, which I, I sometimes refer to as a cheat. Um, there is one nerve in particular that only does two jobs at this point. At this point, there's a nerve called the posterior osseous nerve that all that it does is transmits pain signals from your wrist to your brain. And the other thing it does, it tells your, your brain what your wrist is doing. Uh, it's called proprioception. So you can close your eyes and you can say, my wrist has been about 45 degrees. That's your posterior osseous nerve that's sending that signal to your brain to tell it. But it's not the only thing that gives proprioception. Your hair follicles do as well. Your skin does as well. Um, so you can get just as good proprioception just by wearing a collar on your or a sweatband. And so anyway, that one particular nerve transmits somewhere between 40 to 60% of the total pain signal from the wrist to your brain. And so it was realized back in about 1981 uh, that if we need to or want to, we can cut that one nerve near the end of it where it enters the wrist. And just by doing that, we can cut your pain by about 40 to 60%. So there's the occasional person who, for one reason or another, instead of fixing their wrist, we just cut that nerve denervation. Also, when we do a repair or reconstruction, we're looking at the nerve anyway. Uh, and so most of the time we'll cut it too in addition. Um, so denervation of the wrist is an effective thing to do, although it is kind of a cheat. It does decrease pain uh, from wrist sprains. And that's in general how, how we treat the wrist sprains. Majority of them do not need surgery. The majority of them will get better in a brace and time. Um, there is one kind of wrist, uh, wrist sprain, which is of a structure called the triangular fibrocartilage complex. That's a very long word. So normally just say TFC or TFCC, it's the same thing. Uh, this brace that's on the screen now is called a wrist widget. It's kind of like a fifth generation brace. Uh, it's a great thing. It was invented by a hand therapist. Uh, and she was smart enough to sit down and think about the mechanism 
of how a TFC gets hurt and why it continues to hurt. And so instead of just giving you a simple brace that stops you moving your wrist, she realized that if you specifically support the TFC with a very low profile brace, you'll get results as good, if not better than the big brace. Meanwhile, you won't get stiff, you won't get weak, you can still live and work in it. So this is called a wrist widget. I love these things. I tore my own TFC, I didn't have surgery, I wore a wrist widget for six months. Um, and the results, generally speaking, are good. Not perfect, there are some people still need surgery. But when this came out, that also, that cut my volume of, TF, of TFC repairs probably by 60%. Um, so let's talk briefly about hand therapists. They have a great role uh, in, in a lot of things, but particularly wrist sprains. Um, therapy on the hand is not simple. It's dramatically different than therapy on the back or therapy on the knee or therapy on the shoulder. It's much more complicated. Uh, and so there is a subdivision of therapists called certified hand therapists, that that's pretty much all they do. Just like there's surgeons who pretty much only do hand stuff, there are therapists. They have five years of training beyond what an average therapist has. And that five years has to be spent training in the hand and the wrist and nothing else. Um, so they really have a phenomenal amount of knowledge. And we in Memphis are really quite lucky. Um, this has become a center of training of hand therapists. So we actually probably have more excellent hand therapists here than anything else. Um, and I in particular are lucky because I'm a hand surgeon. I trained, as I mentioned, at Philadelphia Hand Center, which is one of the top three in the country. Uh, uh, it was started originally by a partnership between a hand surgeon and a person who wanted to do therapy on the hand. Hand therapy didn't exist back then. Uh, but together they sat down, they started the center, and they also started a thing called the Hand Rehabilitation Foundation. And they invented the whole concept of hand therapy. Uh, and they wrote the book together uh, that every hand therapist used until about five years ago. The woman who wrote that book, uh, I, I saw her just before she died. She died about 24 years ago. Um, she was awesome and she really changed the world uh, with her ability to provide and teach others how to do hand therapy. And so, as mentioned, we have several qualified hand therapists here. And I think I can't be a good hand surgeon without good hand therapy. I really think it's as simple as that. You have to have a good hand therapist. And we do. Uh, I'm quite lucky in that context. Uh, we, have, we have several. Here's a picture of six of them. Uh, there is an institution called the Southern Hand Center. Uh, they have several different locations. I'll get to that in a second. And they come to our office for those people who don't want to or can't travel to them. So their main office is in East Memphis. And they have another office in Jackson. And they have another office in Dyersburg. And they have another office in DeSoto County. Uh, but for people who are in Germantown or Bartlett, um, if they choose not to go into East Memphis, they do go to our Bartlett office and they go to our Germantown office uh, and they subcontract for us and provide services there. And they do a really, really good job. And so Julie uh, in the middle is the, the boss and the owner of the local locations. Um, and as mentioned, she's one of the best therapists I've ever worked with and I've worked with the best. Um, I think she does a great job. Um, moving back, next topic, something else that wasn't discussed is wrist arthroscopy. Um, arthroscopy means camera in a joint or picture inside of a joint. Um, and so arthroscopy was first invented in the late fifties, um, it was done only in the knee for years and years and years invented in Japan. Uh, and then it moved into other countries, including the United States. We were the second place to use it. Uh, and then it's moved into other joints. There's now not many joints we can't do arthroscopy of. Um, and the wrist was one of the really hard ones because the wrist is a series of eight little tiny bones surrounded by two big bones and five more bones. Uh, so instead of being a nice big open joint like the knee is or the shoulder is, it's a bunch of little spaces. And the cameras can only get so small and the instruments can only get so small. Uh, so it is a difficult thing to do to do a good wrist arthroscopy. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I don't think there's many people around here who, who really do an excellent job with it. Uh, I think the reason for that is that in America, it was really evolved in two centers. And one of them, believe it or not, is University of Mississippi Medical Center. Uh, another one is Philadelphia Hand Center. Um, so I think I trained with the people who wrote the book, who invented the procedure. Um, and I think I can do a pretty darn good job with the risk scope. 
So like all other arthroscopies, it's small incisions, usually about the size of a tip of a pen. Uh, through one of those little holes, we call them portals. We put a camera in through another one of those little holes. Uh, we put a little instrument and somewhere we, we have to pump in water and we have to pump water out so we can keep things pushed open and washed so we can see what we're doing. Um, and those things that we can do with wrist arthroscopy, generally speaking, leads to less pain, less stiffness, um, quicker recover, easy recovery. And if we're working on something small, we can actually do a better job because the camera can magnify it. So for example, I mentioned TFC. When we do operation on the TFC, the vast majority of times we do it with the scope. Um, and we get much better results that way. Uh, however, my last line, indications remain dynamic. I say that because, as I mentioned, I trained at one of the places that invented it. So as part of my training, if anybody had wrist pain and it wasn't a broken wrist, we scoped him. In fact, we even scoped him for broken wrists. We, we were trying to figure out, number one, how do you do it? Number two, when do you do it? And so when I left, they hadn't really finalized the idea of when. So we, I scoped people all the time, you know, for almost no reason as part of my training. It was just the way it was done. And so nowadays, uh, once I get out of the training center and into the community, I have to stop and reflect and say, when should I do this? Um, and the brief answer is no one's ever really figured out when it should be done versus when it doesn't get done. Um, so with a few exceptions, I generally give people a trial of other things. Uh, before I suggest them a scope and see if I can get them better otherwise. Again, the best example is the TFC. We didn't know how to fix TFCs by scope until about 1995. People have been injuring their TFCs for thousands of years. So what did everybody do until 1995? Did people suffer? Were people disabled by TFC tears? And the answer is no. You know, People might've had a little bit of wrist pain, but they, they weren't disabled. So I do do it. I don't do it every day anymore. I don't, don't do it every week anymore. Um, we always try other things and we try to give people time. And again, the wrist widget is highly successful in getting people to heal. So not nearly as often as I used to do. Um, next topic we'll talk about is wrist fractures. Uh, he mentioned these kind of briefly. This is just a picture um, where you can see what we're talking about. Those, those two bones, they're called the radius and the ulna. Um, they're very commonly fractured. Um, it's the second most common bone to break in the body. And by the way, fracture and break are the same thing. Just a fancy word. Um, interestingly, it's usually the radius that breaks because the way we're engineered, the radius takes 90% of the pressure we put on our hand and the ulna, the other bone only takes 10%. Uh, so it's typically the radius that heals. And when they both break, it's almost always the radius that's much worse than the ulna. Um, there was a time back when I was beginning my training uh, where again, you know, we doctors, we learned how to do things first and then we learned, should we do them? So there was a, how do you fix the ulna? When do you fix the ulna? Um, and the most recent data by most recent, I mean about 15 years ago, uh, was that you should only fix the ulna if you have to fix the ulna. Uh, and so the ulna's primary job is to provide stability to the wrist joint. And so if you fix the radius and it's stable, you don't fix the ulna. Uh, if you fix it and it's unstable, in other words, I can pop it in and out of joint by pushing on it while you're asleep, then I fix the ulna. Uh, when you break them, you have a couple options. As always, you always have the option of doing nothing and living with something. I don't know why you would. Um, you know, if you're out in the woods, uh, if you live in a fourth world country, um, but if you have access to healthcare, I don't know, know why you would do nothing, but it's an option. Uh, you can wear a brace. There are some fractures that that's a good idea. There are some fractures that's an okay idea. There's some fractures it's a bad idea, uh, but it's always an option. Just wear a brace until it heals, which on average is two months. Uh, you can wear a cast. Cast is better than a brace by a little bit. Um, you, have, you have a more likely result, more likely to come out with a good result if you wear a cast than a brace to a certain extent. Um, and then there's three different kinds of surgeries we do. One of the original surgeries was we, we do to people is we used to put little pins in. With pins, it's almost like a porcupine. You take the two pieces, you place them together, you drive some pins through it so they stay together. You have to put at least two pins in, at least nine degrees to each other. So you architecturally and mechanically, that's how you get things stable. Um, and we still do pins on the wrist bones occasionally, but nowhere near as much as we did 30 years ago. Nowhere near as much because we have better options for most fractures. So typically pins that I do nowadays 
x-rays are done on somebody whose fracture is really not that bad, but bad enough to need surgery. And at the same point, it's typically got to be somebody who I don't know can make it through the surgery that I need to do for a distal radius fracture. Unfortunately, people do pass away every once in a while with surgery. So we always have to pick our people, pick our risk factors. And so as an example, not to be an ageist, but if I have, and I just had yesterday, an 85 year old come in with a badly broken wrist, I'm not going to bring that person to the operating room and, and, and fix the broken wrist unless I absolutely positively have to. And if I absolutely positively have to, I'm probably going to do it with pins. Okay. But for the average person, we're talking about plates and screws. Uh, that technology has improved tremendously as well. There is a doctor also from Miami. His name is Jorge Orbe. He's actually from Cuba originally. He, um, very smart guy. His brother's mechanical engineer. They sat down together in the early 90s. Uh, right after they came to America from Cuba. Um, and they agreed with each other that the technology we had, it really wasn't that good. Uh, it, it relied on friction. The old fashioned plates, you have to establish friction between the plate and the, and the uh, bone in order to make it hold in the right spot. And there's not always friction for various reasons. So there were a number of fractures we couldn't heal, or we had to do some pretty terrible things to somebody to get them to almost heal. And uh, they came up with a much better idea. And so everybody in the world has copied them now. Um, and, and that technology has evolved and evolved and evolved. Uh, and so nowadays we are pretty good at, at fixing broken wrists and getting good results. I say that carefully because I don't want God to get mad at me and hit me with a lightning bolt. Uh, I don't want anybody to get mad at me if they have a bad result. Uh, but generally speaking, we can get a pretty darn good result if we operate on somebody, if we do it in a timely fashion. Now, what I mean by that? Well, Bone's alive, it wants to heal. So if you break a bone and you let it just sit where it is, it'll heal in that position. And as it heals in that position, the edges of the broken bone, where they start kind of like little puzzle pieces, and with a little puzzle, you can look at the pieces and puzzle put them together. Once the puzzle pieces get washed away and, you know, like cardboard, uh, they don't fit together anymore. Uh, so you, it, it becomes more and more difficult to figure out what goes where, what is what. And a, a good round number is about two weeks. You know, after about two weeks, it gets to be really difficult to fix the bone, it requires significant expertise. Uh, once it gets to four weeks, it's usually impossible. So my preference is for someone to see me the day after they break their wrist and for me to get them in the operating room about a week later. That way some of the swelling will go away. If there's less swelling, there's less pain. I can see what I'm doing a little better. Um, and I've still got an extra week in case there's some need to delay. Uh, by the time it gets to be two weeks, it's hard. Um, I do fix a lot of broken wrists because uh, again, I, I trained at a place where, the, where Dr. Orbe kind of evolved the system. Um, and I think when I came to Memphis in 2004, I was the first and only person uh, who was using the modern techniques. And there was a little while where I did a silly number of broken wrists. Uh, I, I was doing something like 400 a year, which is too much. Um, again, because I was the only person. Um, and then everybody else learned how to do it. You know, when they saw the, re the results and, the, and younger guys moved into town. Uh, and so now I'm nowhere near the only guy. I think everybody who fixes broken wrists fixes them basically the same way now. Um, and so I, I do a much smaller volume, which to be honest, I'm glad. I, I don't want to do that many broken wrists. Um, but I do do at least, I would think I average about five a month, six a month nowadays. Um, that need surgery. Again, I, I try not to operate on people. I try to find non-operative met methods for them with their broken wrist. Uh, but anyway, plates and screws are the modern thing. It's not like welding. You're not healed as soon as we're done. Um, the plates are just holding your bones in the right spot while they heal. They still have to heal. Uh, it still takes about two months on average for the broken bone to heal. And then lastly, sometimes either because the option, if the fracture is just horrible, or because a person showed up too late, uh, or for any one of a number of reasons, uh, we can't fix it. And then we have a group of procedures we do, we call them salvage procedures. And salvage just means we're trying to make the best of a bad situation. We realize we can't make it perfect, but you know what, what, what can we do about this terrible problem? Uh, and so there are several salvage operations. Um, the simplest to understand is a total fusion where we put a plate across your entire wrist from your mid forearm up into your hand. We scrape the surface out of all the bones in here uh, so that you have bleeding bone touching against bleeding bone with plates squishing together. And over time, they grow into one solid bone. 
Um, and so that is a successful thing. Of course, there is a price to be paid by that. You don't move your wrist ever again. Uh, now, I know that sounds like a terrible thing, but if you think about it, when you're wearing a brace, you're not moving your wrist. And when you're wearing a cast, you're not moving your wrist. And people can still survive and still live. And they can still do most things. There's very few things you need to do this when you can do this. Or very few things that you need to do this when you can do this. Okay. And these things are what your wrist does. This is not your wrist. This is your forearm and you can still do it. Um, so that's one, uh, one option. There is a number of others. Uh, and I don't think I want to go into too much detail. Um, the other ones give you a result that's theoretically better uh, because you have more motion. But at the same point, fusion has a very total fusion has a very high success rate. The other operations kind of middling. Um, so fusion is the most reliable total fusion. But there's other options, including I already mentioned the post neurosis nerve uh, excision. You, we can just cut that nerve uh, and cut your pain by 40% when we do that. Um, so anyway, those are the options there. And those are referring to the two big bones of the forearm that are entering the wrist and by some people's definition are part of the wrist and other people they're, they're not. Uh, everyone agrees that the eight little small bones that are actually you know from here to here, there's two rows of four, that's how most of us think of them. Um, they're each only about the size of a dice, you know, like going to a casino, just that kind of dice. Um, and they have very meticulous interconnections with those 37 ligaments, but also they're shaped to fit together perfectly while at the same time still move. And so it's really an amazing piece of engineering. Uh, they're covered with a substance, which if you wanna be technical, it's called hyaline cartilage. I tend to call it articular cartilage. It is cartilage, but it's cartilage that's very slippery. It's a little different than every other kind of cartilage. And in fact, it's more slippery than Teflon when it's wet. Uh, and that cartilage is what makes joints actually be car be joints where you can move them without them hurting, without them clicking or clenching. And so when someone gets arthritis, the fundamental problem is the cartilage is not doing its job anymore. And when someone breaks their wrist or sprains their wrist, the cartilage is also injured uh, to some degree or another. So when we fix bones, we don't fix the cartilage because we can't, we don't have the technology to fix cartilage, but we can't, the cartilage is attached to the bones like it's anchor. And so the cartilage won't heal unless the anchor is right. But if the anchor is right, the cartilage can heal and it can heal well. We have to get the bone right for the cartilage to be right. But anything that changes the way the cartilage interacts with each other, how it rubs, whether it slides, whether there's a lot of pressure or not so much pressure, anything that changes that will lead to bad symptoms. It'll lead to increased wear, it'll lead to increased pain, increased swelling, and increased stiffness. And so of those eight little small bones, roughly half the time that any one of them is broken, it's the scaphoid. Scaphoid's the bad actor, um, but it's not its fault. It's like this because it is the cornerstone. It holds everything else in the right place. So anything that causes any of those bones to move, that pressure is going to be transmitted to the scaphoid. And the scaphoid, when you look at it from the side, looks like a kidney bean or even kind of like a peanut. It's got a little skinny waist. And so all that pr pressure has to pass through the waist, which is only, smaller than my finger. Um, it's a lot smaller than my fingers, matter of fact. Um, and so that's the most common place for bones to break. Wrist bones, small wrist bones. And then the other thing that's important about the scaphoid is that for a collection of reasons, unlike every other bone in your body, every other bone in your body or 99% of the other bones in your body, when you break them, they know they're broken, they wanna heal. This bone doesn't wanna heal. When you break it, half the time it doesn't heal. Half the time it does. Um, and one of the interesting things about that, God or evolution has given us this ability that when you break it, it doesn't hurt that much. So it's a very common thing for someone to come in and tell me, my reverse has been hurting for two months. I have no idea what I did. And I look at x-rays and I come back and say, so did you play high school football? Or were you in a car accident 15 years ago? And they look at me and say, how did you know that? And I'll say, well, because you broke your scaphoid. And I can tell by looking at it, your scaphoid wasn't broken yesterday. Your scaphoid was broken years ago and it never healed. And of course they find it hard to believe. They have to go home and they have to Google it. And by the way, I don't mind that at all. Um, but once they Googled it, they come back. I tell them to go Google it and come back. Um, and now they're ready to talk about it. So with the scaphoid, we want it to heal when it gets broken. And this is again, an important piece of information. The earlier one with a scaphoid fracture gets in the doctor's office, the more likely that is to heal. 
we have to immobilize it properly uh, or else it will not heal. So anybody hurts over here by the base of their thumb, you can find this little hole. You can stick your finger in right, right between your wrist and your thumb. That's where the scaphoid lives. And if that hurts when you put, when you, after you fall, you need to come see somebody. You need to come see somebody pretty quickly. Um, some of them will heal if properly immobilized. And some of them won't heal no matter what. So it's my job to be the expert. And not only to figure out that you have a scaphoid fracture, but look at it and give you an accurate prediction, as accurate as I can humanly be, whether this is more likely or less likely to heal if we immobilize it. And if it's more likely, that's what we do. We mobilize it and then we watch it carefully. If it's less likely, I give you the option. We could wait and see. We you know, wait anywhere from three weeks to three months uh, and see if it's healing or we can just fix it. If we fix it, we increase that rate of healing from 50 to 85%. 85 is not a good number. We doctors are never proud of 85% success rates, but that's the number. No matter what we do and how we try, uh, no one's ever been able to show in a large study any higher than 85% success rate from fixing the scaphoid. And there's reason for that. Uh, the biggest one is that it's tiny. Uh, it has a lot of motion. Um, it has a very poor blood supply. Your body needs blood to carry oxygen and sugar and carry away waste products. And the bone cannot heal if it doesn't have enough blood, it doesn't have enough oxygen, all that kind of stuff. Um, so... We can't always fix it, but we can often fix it. And if we don't fix it, as I mentioned, half the time it doesn't heal. Uh, so we, we just have to be real careful. And there's more details that can be filled in there. If you don't fix it and it doesn't heal over time, the scaphoid actually collapses, like a, just like a peanut break in the middle. As I mentioned, it's the cornerstone. So when it collapses and does this, all the other bones around it all start doing weird things and moving their own directions. And it causes a predictable wear pattern where everything wears out. Um, so options, again, always have the option to live with it. You can live with it if you want. I'll tell you, it's not the right thing to do. It's a, it's a bad mistake. But if, if you want, want to do that, it's your body, it's your life, it's your choices. You can wear a brace. Wearing a brace is better than nothing. It does increase your chance of healing a little bit. You can wear a cast. That's a lot better than a, than a brace. Um, and, and that is the standard answer if... Number one, you choose it. And number two, I advise it because of the details of your fracture. Um, on the other hand, if I tell you, no, that's a mistake, you should fix it. And here's the reason why. There, there are several details why, depending upon where it's broken and how it's broken. Uh, we often fix it. And that's called internal fixation. Um, and so that operation is much better than the alternative. Um, initially, Back when this was first invented, which was around 1972, uh, it had a first generation of a technology, uh, which we vastly improved upon now. Um, and in order to get it to, to, to get there, the scaphoid is hard to get at. It's down deep in a hole. Uh, you used to have to make an incision that's about this big uh, to fix your scaphoid. And nowadays, if the details are right, I can often fix it in an incision that's about that big. Um, I can get it exactly in the right spot and get a screw in exactly the right spot. And I can tell you, you know, it's probably going to heal. I've had some of our professional soccer players and baseball players who we fix it and they do fine. Um, so for those ones that are likely to need fixation, uh, I want to fix it relatively early. Uh, so we have a better chance of getting a good result. Uh, it turns out you don't need your whole scaphoid, at least not everybody needs a whole scaphoid. So there are some people who, when it breaks, for one reason or another, instead of fixing it, we take half of it out. I personally think that's a bad idea. I don't do that operation a lot. Uh, but some people do okay with that. The problem is that when you take half of it out, the tendency is for all the other that fit around it to all collapse. So the most common answer, if you're going to excise it, is you're going to do a, a fusion. We talked about a fusion before on the wrist. This is a little bit different. Um, but you can do a partial fusion where there's only a couple of bones being fused together or a complete fusion. And again, I don't want to get into too many details in the presentation. You know, that's something that if the problem happens, we'll talk through the options and the risks and the alternatives um, and then make a decision together. Um, I, I kind of sort of alluded, there are a few things that predict poor outcome. Um, and, and the second biggest is displacement. If the pieces have moved, if they're not lined up perfectly, 
um, they don't heal, generally speaking. The biggest one is if it's been detached from its blood supply. And so, for example, if it's broken in more than one pieces, or if it broke and dislocated, it's detached from its blood supply. And if it's detached from its blood supply, it's, it's not going to heal. Uh, delay. I mentioned that already. If you delay treatment, um, the pieces between the bones, it fills in with scab. Uh, and the scab just gets in the way of the bone healing. So the way you want to stop scab from healing is you take the two pieces and you push them together and you make sure there's nothing in between besides nothing. Uh, and you squeeze the pieces together and then that's how they tend to grow. So any kind of delay, it fills in with scab and then it, it tends not to heal. Plus also, as it moves, it can detach itself from a blood vessel if we're still attached to it. As I mentioned several times, it is the cornerstone of the wrist. It holds everything else together. So any motion, even of your thumb, does put pressure on your scaphoid bone. And it can force the two pieces to move. This is a picture, uh, two pictures actually, of different ways to fix it. The most common way is on my left, I guess it's on your left too. Uh, and that's a single headless screw uh, that has variable pitch, which means that it's, the more you turn it, it actually squeezes the pieces together. And so we know from studies, and there's been lots and lots of scientific studies, this is a triumph of science, um, that if you get that screw right down the middle third of the bone and you make the screw as long as you can get it while still being in bone on both sides, that's a home run. That, that's how you want to fix that. And so that picture on the left is a picture with a screw going right down that bone. It's much harder to do than it looks. It's really a very tricky operation to do. Um, but boy, does it improve results. And so as I mentioned, the professional athletes, that's what we're going to do with professional athlete. And at least in theory, you do that to a professional athlete, they can be back playing within a couple of days. Now, I don't do that for weekend warriors. I don't think it's worth the risk. You're not losing a million dollars a week by not playing. Uh, for weekend warriors, I want to see it healing before you're going to go back. So I'm going to wait at least a month and probably two. The next picture is, is a little bit more interesting to me. That's plates and screws on that bone. That's extremely uncommon. Uh, uh, there's only a small handful that have ever had to put plates and screws in. These screws are no bigger than the screws in your eyeglasses. Um, and it's, it's, I put it in, in kind of an interesting thing um, to see, to see the little tiny plates and screws. But occasionally that's the indicated way to fix it. There's also occasion we have to put two screws in it. You have to put two smaller screws, narrower screws, and put them side by side. Um, and so that's how we want to fix it. Moving on to the next topic, thumb arthritis, thumb basal joint arthritis. The basal joint is the base of your thumb where your thumb meets your wrist. It goes by a couple of different names, basal joint, and also goes by the carpal metacarpal or CMC joint. It is the foundation of the thumb. It holds your thumb up. It provides the leverage through which you pinch and squeeze and grasp. It is the first joint to wear out in the body and almost everybody. Basically, every female will get arthritis of the thumb basal joint if they live into at least their 50s. And men have to live into their 70s, but men who live in their 70s get arthritis of the thumb basal joint. It's a very interesting thing. Um, you could ask the question why. The brief answer is, I don't know. God didn't tell me. Uh, but the long answer is, if you look at things that are unique about it, it has more motion than any other joint in the body. It has more different directions that it moves than any other joint in the body. And that's probably the problem. The cartilage probably isn't quite up to the task of the amount of pinching that we sometimes do in different directions simultaneously. Uh, and that's probably the root. And then women are probably worse than men because women have estrogen uh, and estrogen makes things stretchy relatively. Uh, and so there's a little bit more stretchiness inside the thumb joint of the average woman than the average the average man. And there's this thing called shear, which means sliding in the direction you're not supposed to slide. Cartilage does not do well when it's under shear. And so women get a lot of shear in their thumb basal joint, more the average woman, more than the average man. And the more shear you get, we're relatively confident the faster the arthritis forms. So that seems to be why it happens so often in women, but it happens in everybody. You know, there's just minor differences. Um, and the thumb is what makes us human more than anything else. The thumb allows us to put, our, um, to, put, to, put to grab onto things forcefully and hold it and use tools. And the use of tools probably is what led to the brain. Um, so anyway, uh, the thumb base joint is incredibly important. Uh, it wears out commonly. We often have to do something. Um, it is forceful gripping and grasping. As I've mentioned, there are some people who are so slippery. Here's a picture where a person where it's at a joint. And if you, again, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but right here, 
That's not what it's supposed to look. It's supposed to look like a saddle. It's supposed to look like somebody's butt in a saddle. And that's basically out of the saddle. Um, you have options. Number one is you can live with it. Um, and actually, because the operation leads to a lot of difficulties and, and a lot of pain, I do encourage people to live with it as much as they can to learn how to cope with it. Part of learning how to cope with it is to learn how to pinch differently, less forcefully, less frequently. Use tools, use wrenches instead of using your thumb. Don't open that bottle of potato chips with your thumbs. Open it with the scissors. Um, there's all kinds of tricks along those lines, and that's a long conversation. Um, if you can live with it long enough, a couple things going to happen. Number one, you're going to get used to it. Number two, as part of our thread, your body grows bone spurs, little pieces that stick out. And they seem to grow in relatively random directions. But if you've got bone spurs coming from both sides of the joint, sooner or later, those random pieces, they're going to touch each other. When they touch each other, they act like a cast. It doesn't move anymore. And so once it stops moving, it stops hurting. It may be deformed, but it stops hurting. So the natural course of our arthritis, your thumb, basal joint is that sooner or later, it'll stop moving from the bone spurs grabbing it onto each other other but that process can take years can take decades and during those years and decades it can hurt quite a bit so it is the rare person who we tell them just leave it alone it'll grow together there are some people who come in who have pain and swelling who already have huge bone spurs and their joint already barely moves at all those people i say you know let's put a cast on it and let's just let those bones finish growing and you'll be fine um, but when i say rare i mean i've probably done that three times in 18 years. Um, again, these, these options are not mutually exclusive. You can live with it and cope. You can modify your activities. There are pills and other medications. Um, and the pills and medications do help. Um, and, and so, you know, we talk about that and we talk about the different pills and try to figure out which one works best for you. One thing that's happened recently that I'm really a fan of, um, there is a couple of different medications which we've used for years and years for various arthritis, there is a group called non serotonin inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. non serotonin inflammatory drugs have a number of predictable consequences, negative consequences, complications. The number one most common thing is they raise the ass in your stomach, which can give you a heartburn, can give you a bleeding ulcer. The number two thing is they raise your blood pressure. And the number three thing, they thin your blood. Um, so the manufacturers always being good capitalists and trying to figure out ways to build a better mousetrap have realized that instead of making them pills and passing through your stomach, you can make them a gel, you can rub them in. And they there's an ingredient inside the gel that helps the other medication pass through your skin. They only get about half inch into your skin before they can't go any further. So it doesn't really make it down to your big blood vessels, doesn't make it to your kidneys or your heart or your stomach. It just makes it to the spot you want to rub it in and they're pretty darn effective at relieving pain. They're as effective as not more effective than the pills. And they're dramatically safer than the pills. They tell me there's about a 2% risk profile of the gels compared to the same active ingredient as a pill. So um, they're, they're so good, the FDA about two years ago decided to make them over the counter. And so about two years ago, Voltaren was the, is the number one brand. Uh, Voltaren gel, spelled with a V, uh, became available over the counter I, and almost... I hate to sound like a broken record, but almost every patient who comes in who has ache and pain near the skin, like thumb arthritis, I ask them, have you tried Voltaren gel? Because it, it, it's almost miraculous in how well it works. And there are other ones too. Uh, but anyway, medications help, the gels help. Uh, braces, another different hand therapist. You can tell I have a lot of respect for hand therapists. Uh, again, sat down and was thinking about the mechanism by which this ha happens and the mechanism by which this hurts. And she realized the breaks we're giving people, it didn't really help. All it did is stop you from using your thumb. And so she designed her own brace. Uh, and uh, there's generally speaking, three different braces I use for this problem. Um, one is the old fashioned one. There's an occasional person, the old fashioned one is right. There is the new fashioned one, which I'll get to in a second. And for some people, they're already so deformed by their arthritis that a brace isn't going to work. It's just going to hurt them more by pushing on them. And for those people, there's an, an elastic brace, which just kind of sort of controls the temperature, gives a little bit of external support and helps people a little bit. So I use that occasionally. The brace that I do like, I might have a slide, I think I do. Well, maybe I don't. Uh, it's called a meta grip, M-E-T-A grip. Um, and a meta grip 
recognizes that this problem, the, the thumb basal joint really is like a saddle. And it really is like the buttock of your thumb bone is sitting in the saddle of your wrist bone. And if your buttock is falling out of the saddle, that's not a comfortable position to be in. So it takes you from the outside and pushes the buttock back into the saddle by kind of sort of turning like a British saddle into a Texas saddle. Uh, and for substantive majority, around 70 or 80% of people with this problem, that makes the problem 70 or 80% better and they can avoid surgery. So again, since this brace came out after I finished my training, uh, it's probably cut in half the volume of surgeries that I do on this problem. Um, hand therapy helps. There, there is some muscles that are sometimes deficient and weak. And if you strengthen that muscle, it'll help keep the buttock in the saddle, just like the brace does. So therapy is always something I consider when there's thumb arthritis. Uh, and then we get down to the two big things. Corticosteroid injections or steroid injections and surgery. Steroid injections I mentioned before work, they decrease pain by decreasing swelling. And often, but not always, their swelling is part of this arthritis. So if one comes in and they've already done a bunch of things and it hasn't helped, uh, and I can feel some swelling down in that joint, cortisone shot's a good option. Um, there are problems with it, of course. It's a needle, it hurts. You can get an infection. We try really hard to avoid infection. I disinfect everybody twice and I, and I numb people as much as I can. Uh, but the cortisone also suppresses your immune system a little tiny bit, really locally rather than the whole body. So there is something in the neighborhood of a one in 300 to one in 400 chance that no matter what I do, if I'm gonna stick someone with a cortisone shot, I'm gonna make them infected. Um, so anyway, also if the cortisone sits on the cartilage itself for reasons we've never quite figured out, it seems to make the arthritis itself worse. So there are also some people who get dramatically worse arthritis after a cortisone shot. They're not common, but they're out there. And so one of our solutions for that problem and a few other problems that happens is we spread them out. We don't let you get a shot more than once every three months because uh, the, the risks seem to be much lower if we wait three months between shots in one body part, so three months between. Uh, and we can give cortisone shots for thumb basal joint arthritis and, and it's highly successful. It's not perfect, but it's highly successful. And lastly, there's surgery. There's about seven different ways to do that operation. Um, and the reason why is because the operation really hurts a lot. So we've been trying for years to figure out how do we get this done in a way that's better and quicker and easier and less painful, years and years and years. Uh, and the jury is still out. Um, I think there is a coalescence. There used to be, when I, when I did my training, there was literally, really 17 uh, ways to fix this. Uh, and, and nowadays, uh, there's, there's a much smaller number of things that are actually trialed and used. Um, Dr. Cole in his presentation talked about a thing called a mini tightrope. And the mini tightrope is extremely common. It probably is the most common operation to do in the country uh, at this point for this problem. The main reason that mini tightrope is done so commonly, besides the fact that it works, is it's relatively quick and easy for the surgeon to do, and it's relatively quick and easy for the patient to recover from. I'm not a huge fan of the mini tightrope. Um, I do use it and I always explain to people, you know, here's my concerns. Um, here's what I know is good about it. Uh, and then I talk with the patient to figure out, do they want to do that? So again, the, the main benefit from your perspective, uh, the mini tightrope is the recovery is about half as long as it is for the alternatives, about half as long. Um, and so if it's important to you, uh, that you recover as quickly as possible, I think a mini tightrope is the way to go. Um, the, the problems with a mini tightrope, uh, let me see, I might stop for a second, get back on what my slides say. I'll come back to that in a minute, okay? Um, just talking back in general, uh, surgery should only be done if you've exhausted all the other options, as far as I'm concerned with this. This is not, there are some things that I tell you, hey, you should fix it. In this one, I say, well, you should only fix it if you're sure you need it. And if you tried everything else, it's not a simple operation. It is take a long recovery uh, and it is painful. We have, we've developed all kinds of tricks to minimize the pain. So don't get me wrong. Uh, we do them all, uh, but you can't change the fact that you're doing a painful operation on people. Meanwhile, is it worth doing? Yeah, if you tried everything else, the quality of life improvement is tremendous. People, do, people have much better quality of life uh, once they've gone through the recovery if they have a bad thumb arthritis and they have, have any one of the operations. So do it regularly still, um, but I always make people sure people understand. 
uh, getting to the list of all, all of the options. And I like to think logically. So I like to put things in groups uh, and then I can fill in the details later on. Uh, the oldest fashioned way of doing it is just taking out one of the two bones that makes that joint up, taking out the trapezium, which again is about the size of a dice, about this big by this big. It's a cube. It has a little bit of a, shadow, a saddle shape to it on the end. Uh, just taking it out and leaving an empty space. The problem is it's the foundation for your thumb. So you can imagine, take the foundation out of underneath your house, what's going to happen? Well, it depends on how, how strong the dirt is. You know, it's possible it's going to drop two inches and be fine. It's also possible you're going to fall into a sinkhole. All right. And so the same thing happens with the thumb. There's some percentage of the people where it'll shorten up a little bit and it'll be fine. And there's other people who it just falls apart and their thumb deforms. So that's an operation that I've effectively never done. It's more of a historical thing, although it's coming back around again. And I'll talk about why in a little while. Um, another option is to look at it and realize that only half of it is wearing out. And so you can take the bone and you can reshape it so that the pressure goes off the half that's wearing and onto the half that's not wearing. Again, that's kind of sort of a historical thing. That was a big part of my, my training. We don't do it very much anymore because the Metagrip brace has come out. And the Metagrip brace does pretty much everything the realignment can do. Um, and the Metagrip brace is just a brace. The realignment is kind of a big operation. Uh, the next thing that was trialed is to realize that part of the problem seems to be from shear from things sliding partially out of joint so if you can stabilize it uh, and stop it from sliding back and forth that might help and that was a long area of research and interest in various different operations to just to add stability without doing anything else um, and th that is still done sometimes uh, particularly if it's if your body's amenable to it i don't do it very often uh, any of this, any of those but occasionally uh, another thing is the, the surface of the cartilage wears out. So there's been lots of research about just changing the surface, just putting something in there, making something slide. Um, I don't think that's a good operation. I, I think that if you're going to go to the trouble and, and the pain and the expense of operating on somebody, you should do something that works. Uh, and resurfacing does not have a good amount of data behind it that it works. So it's, it's very rarely done. I think I might have done two in 18 years. Um, another option is replacement. Put in a prosthetic joint. That was really popular in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but that operation fails 27% of the time within three years, uh, which most doctors now in America have agreed that that's just an unacceptable failure rate. Uh, so... Uh, it has become less and less popular every year. I'm not sure there's even a manufacturer making a joint replacement right now for the thumb. Um, they kind of sort of come and go. And then when they realize their failure rate is terrible, after a couple of years, they take that replacement off the market and they bring back another one. And I think right now they're all off the market. I know there's one that was around a couple of years ago and I know it's coming back with a new design. Um, but you can tell by the fact that I don't know that I don't use it. Um, I'm not sure if there's anybody in Memphis right now who's doing joint replacements. Dr. Borland, who I mentioned before, I have all the respect for in the world. He did replacements and he got good results. Um, that's one of the jokes the guy who trained me always joked about was that there's only a small cadre of about 15 doctors across the country who get good results and they, no one knows why they get good results and the rest of us don't. Uh, but I don't think there's anybody doing joint replacement in Memphis right now. Now we're getting to the, into suspension. Suspension is when you literally take the two bones and you pull them apart and you hold them apart some way, shape, or form. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. The tightrope is one of the ways to do that. And so the tightrope is used for that. And lastly, as I mentioned before about arthrodesis or fusions, you can take two bones, take the surface off of them, squish them together. And as long as you hold them squished together, they will grow into one solid bone over time. And that can be done on your thumb basal joint. That is what's done on someone who is a heavy manual laborer. Um, it's not really done in anybody else. Uh, and it's an operation that is not done commonly uh, because it's somewhat severe. If you can't move the base of your thumb, all you can do is this uh, the rest of your life. It really does take away some of your function. Uh, so it's only done under circumstances that are somewhat uncommon. Um, now getting back to this, so here is the two most common currently and the historic most common or third most common way of doing this. Uh, the classic operation first described in 1975 is called a ligament retentioning tendon interposition. 
which is a long word, so we shorten it to LRTI. Uh, tightrope, Dr. Cole talked about it. And again, I encourage you to look at his video. I don't disagree with him, I just have a different take. And an arthroplasty, Dr. Borland did it this way. We don't disagree with him, I just have a different take. Uh, arthroplasty uncommon today, like I mentioned. Tightrope and LRTI, the two most common. Both of, well, really all three of these procedures share one thing very much in common, and that is the trapezium, that the bone that cause, forms the foundation, it's got to go. Uh, and trapezium comes out. And then we have to stabilize everything else so that things don't just fall into the hole that used to be there. Um, and so how do you do it? Well, the tightrope, uh, you, you're just, I don't want to get too graphic, but you're just drilling a hole through the base of the thumb into your index finger or the index hand bone. And then you're putting this thing that's very much like a hammock between those two bones and you're using, you're using this hammock to hold them together. Now, if anybody's ever in the hammock, you know that if you're laying in the middle of your hammock, it's a pretty nice place to be. It works, it holds you up. But if the hammock's not supported very well on either end, or if you kind of turn too much one direction or another, you, you're gonna meet the ground. Um, and, and that's one of my problems uh, with the tightrope versus the LRTI. Um, my training, my fundamental training is actually in spinal cord injuries. And the first rule of spinal cord injury is decompress. The second rule of spinal cord injury is stabilize. Uh, and so that's my stripes. And, and with the tightrope, I don't feel that there's enough stability, particularly not in the third dimension. It's a one-dimensional structure. So I, 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 I'm, it's hard for someone to convince me that this one-dimensional structure is going to get you three-dimensional stability. Uh, and because of that, the first couple of years tightropes were out, I just didn't do them. I waited for other people to show me that they worked. Uh, they do work. If you do it exactly right, and if uh, you know the plants are in the right alignment, they, they work well. Um, the other problem with an RTI, I'm sorry, a tightrope, in my opinion, uh, is the material it's made out of. It has two metallic buttons that are made of titanium, which I think are fine. And then the structure in the middle, the actual hammock, is made of a material that's a cousin of Kevlar, which is very strong uh, and is relatively non-reactive inside the body. Um, my problem with it is there was another version of this operation invented back in 1978. And, and back then they used Gore-Tex and that was a miserable failure. Three, five years later, they, they all fell apart. And, and I've never had anybody explain to me why this Kevlar material is any different than the Gore-Tex material. Um, so I waited until the five-year five data came out before I did any. And when the five-year data came out and showed a good result, I started doing a couple you know, and people who were well-informed and were the proper patients. And then when the 10-year data came out and it was still good, I was surprised, um, I, I started doing it more commonly. So I did about a third of my operations with the tightrope. Um, but mostly people want to recover quickly. Um, the LRTI is more like a bunk bed where you have, you know, big wooden posts, cross beams, controlling everything in three dimensions. LRTI is a much more complicated operation to do. Um, yeah, I have to drill multiple holes and I have to weave in three dimensions. Um, it takes a lot longer. It takes probably somewhere between 40 minutes to an hour and a half longer to do an LRTI than it takes to do a tightrope. Um, but it gives you two or three benefits. Uh, number one is you do have three-dimensional fixation. So it's much more rigid. Number two, you have it with a living structure, which if it gets injured, it's going to heal itself with time in all likelihood. Number three, the three-dimensional structure also allows you to correct deformities, where a mini tightrope doesn't really let you correct deformity. Now, is a deformity important? It looks weird. Does a deformity stop you from using your hand? No, not really. I like to do to the RTIs partially because it looks better. I hate to sound terrible, but I, I like to look at something and say, look, that looks great. It functions great. Um, and RTIs look great, and they function great. Um, tightropes don't look as good. Because uh, they don't correct the entire deformity, particularly not the tendency of your thumb to do this. Uh, it's called a thumb and palm deformity. It happens very often with, with thumb arthritis. Uh, I'm exaggerating for the camera. It's not usually that bad. Plus, also, you hyperextend this knuckle, which I can't do. It's not normal to hyperextend it. But you end up having kind of sort of this Z-shaped thumb where most of your thumb is in your palm. And with a tight rope, you really can't correct that. Uh, but with, with LTI, you can so for those kind of reasons, my preference is doing RTI, even though I acknowledge that it takes much longer to recover. And I always tell people, you've got these two options. You know, one I'm confident, one I'm a little less confident. Uh, the one that I'm confident is gonna take three months 
uh, to get to the mostly recovered point and six months to get to the completely recovered point where the mini tightrope, you're going to be partially recovered three weeks. Uh, and generally speaking, you're almost completely recovered six weeks. Um, so mini tightrope is, is much quicker. There's just, there's just no denying that. And so people say, you know what, uh, I need to play golf in three months. I say, okay, well, let, let's do the mini tightrope. Uh, for people to say, you know, I don't have anything going on. I, I, I'm still, I'm only 70. I'm going to live a at least 20 more years. I'd rather you do the thing that you know will last for 20 years. And by the way, there is data on LTIs that last for 20 and 30 and 40 years. There's no data on, on, on uh, tightrope beyond 10 years. Um, so for all those reasons, my preference is to do it to do an RTI. I don't do it the way it was originally described. Uh, there is a modification called a Thompson modification, which I use. Um, don't need to get too technical, um, but it's a more modern version of the same concept. Um, so moving on, next topic that Dr. Cole discussed is things like carpal tunnel and trigger finger and decoir veins. Um, they're really the same disease. It's just a different location. And because it's a different location, it's quote neighbors are different. Um, and therefore the, what you perceive is different. Uh, carpal tunnel happens when there is swelling in the tendons inside your carpal tunnel, which is a small, narrow space that goes from your wrist to your hand. And a bunch of things are crowded in that space. And so if one structure swells, it'll rub against its neighbor, which makes another neighbor swell, which makes another neighbor swell. And the middle of all these structures is your nerve. And the nerve is made mostly out of fat. So the nerve is very squishy. And so it gets squished. When your nerve gets squished, carpal tunnel happens. Uh, meanwhile, trigger finger and decoir veins uh, are in different parts of your body. Trigger finger is right where your hand ends, your finger ends, uh, where they come together. And the nerve is not in the tunnel. It's just barely outside the tunnel. Some people occasionally get a little bit of tingling from trigger finger, but not really. But they really notice their finger gets caught or pops. Um, and the queer veins happens where your thumb meets your wrist, right about here. And so people mostly notice swelling and pain. There is a nerve there. So they'll have occasional numbness and burning going up like this. Um, all three of them have the same basic cause, the same basic treatments. Um, surgery is basically the same except for where you're doing it. And so there's variations on that theme. Um, for every one of them, uh, with only one exception, uh, we always you know, give you options. Uh, we try the most safe, least invasive thing first and work our way up the pyramid until we get to surgery. That's frustrating to some people because surgery, everyone knows about it. Everyone knows that people do generally pretty well with surgery. And some people just want the surgery. But there is an occasional person who's going to have a bad result from surgery. And I have to sleep in the morning. I got to look in the mirror. I'm sorry, I got to sleep at night. I got to look in the mirror in the morning. Uh, I got to make sure that I never rush somebody to surgery without thinking it through and making all reasonable non-surgical options, surgical trials. Um, and so there are non-surgical things that we go through. Uh, cortisone shots, braces, pills, um, well, Tyron Gel and its cousins, all those things are worth doing. I said one exception. What do I mean? Well, the one exception is that in the carpal tunnel, the nerve is getting squished. And if you squish any nerve long enough or hard enough, you can kill it. And once the nerve is dead, we cannot help you anymore. It's rarely something that happens quickly. Carpal tunnel typically happens over months to years. So it's not like someone's choking on on a walnut in a curb, but in some ways it is like someone's choking on a walnut in a curve. They're not, with a walnut, they're going to die in 10 or 15 minutes or maybe even two. Uh, carpal tunnel, it's 10 or 15 months, but maybe two. Uh, but once that person is dead, you can't help them. Once that nerve is dead, we can't help you. So if you come in and there's a good indication your nerve is suffocating and getting ready to die, we say, you know what? You got a simple decision. And one is to have surgery. Another one is to let nature take its course and let your nerve die. Um, so on those people, we kind of sort of tell them there's really only one right choice here. It's still your body, it's still your life, it's still your choice to make, but there's only one that's right. And if someone tells me they don't want surgery, I want to know why. Uh, and I want to delve into why don't you want surgery? Are you afraid? Is it a financial issue? Is there something I can do to help you with this decision to make the right decision? Um, and I never tell anybody that they have to do it, but I do tell them there's only one right answer here. And so uh, I, I want to try to knock down anything, any reason why, why, why you can't get it done. But again, in the end, it's their body, it's their life, it's their choices. Uh, so again, these are three co common conditions. Dr. Cole talked about them in more detail. I don't think I'm going to go into them anymore. 
uh, except for this. Risk factors. Again, this is something he, he covered, but I want to cover it again. I think it's important. People come into the office all the time and they say things like, well, I was a secretary for 10 months, 40 years ago. Is that what caused my carpal tunnel? I don't know where this idea got in the population. It must have been an I love Lucy or something. Uh, but as much logic as it makes that the keyboard is the cause of carpal tunnel, when it's studied scientifically, studies have been done hundreds of times all over the planet, all different kinds of people, different ethnic groups, different backgrounds, different nations. The result of the study is always the same. It's not keyboarding that causes carpal tunnel. Uh, it's medical conditions mostly. And then there's a few other things like broken wrists. Um, there's a few people that are born with little tiny narrow carpal tunnels. Uh, there, it, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's not always work. I'm saying it's not the keyboard. There are other things people do at work, like you know factory workers who are doing forceful squeezing while they're bending their wrist. That has been shown to cause it. But the person who sits at a keyboard, even secretaries who type a lot, that's not been shown scientifically to cause carpal tunnel. Um, there is a role in keyboarding, but that role is not the act of using the keyboard. It's the, it's the position you put in your wrist in. And so keyboarding can be made perfectly safe by modifying the position in which your wrist is in when you keyboard it. Um, it's typically extreme flexion or extension. So we try to get you to type like this instead of typing like this or like this. And similarly, anything else you're doing in life, if you're doing lots of things in this position, that will tend to cause carpal tunnel. What are you doing in this position that tends not to cause carpal tunnel? If you think about it, look at, let me use my hands to describe a tunnel. We've got a tunnel here. You can imagine things going through this tunnel and it, the tunnel's got a good amount of space in it. What happens if I do this? How hard is it to get through that space now? You can't see through it anymore. You know, so the wrist that's either extended or flexed makes that tunnel harder for things to get through, particularly they're sliding back and forth. They're continuous. Um, so with the wrist in neutral position, which is just about five degrees or 10 degrees from extent, uh, extended from, from straight. So that that's neutral position. Um, so avoiding positions of flexion or extension is good. Uh, a lot of people without realizing they're doing it, they sleep like this or like this or like this. Um, and so sleeping in a brace that prevents you from doing those things has definitively been shown to help more than half the population that has the problem. So sleeping in a brace is encouraged. There are pills, as we talked about before. Um, not a huge fan of them for this problem. You know, my best metaphor is if there's a pebble in your shoe and it hurts when you walk, do you take a pill for that or do you get the pebble out of your shoe? Um, so there's exceptions to that rule. There are some people who clearly need a pill, um, but not so much. Uh, steroid injections, as I mentioned before, anytime that there is swelling and you put the cortisone in the swelling area, the swelling will tend to go away and more swelling will not happen. So a cortisone shot for carpal tunnel is highly successful. 80 to 85% of people get better. The problem is only about half of those people that get better stay better. The other half, it's transient. But you know what? 40% is not nothing to shake a stick at. So most of the time, if you've not gotten better with activity modification, bracing, maybe trying a little bit of a pill, uh, shot is the next thing. We see if it works and we see if it endures. And if it works in the doors, we say, hallelujah, thank the Lord, move on. Learn the stuff we talked about. Don't keyboard in this position or do anything else in this position. Um, and good luck to you, have a good life. On the other hand, if it's temporary, how temporary? You know, if it's temporary by a couple of weeks, you can't get a quarter of shot a couple of weeks the rest of your life. It just will give you trouble. So if it's a short period improvement, we tell you, you should have surgery. If it's a long time term period improvement, we tell you, well, you've got two legitimate options you can have another shot. And, and the chances of another shot working longer, longer than the first shot, they're basically zero. So it's not gonna work better than the previous shot. It's gonna work either a little bit less well or about the same. And so if that's something you wanna do, get shots over and over again, okay. As long as we're talking about you know twice a year or three times a year, it's fine. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't wanna do that, or if your carpal tunnel is bad and it's maybe killing the nerve, or I tell you, you know what? You've had enough cortisone. It's bad for your body. Um, or you just tired of the problem. And you just you don't want another temporary fix. You you want a permanent fix. The surgery is a good surgery. Now I know people hear the stories in the news and they, you talk to friends and stuff like that and you hear about the bad result. But if you study it scientifically, you'll find that 85% of people who had a carpal tunnel waste are happy with the result. 85. 
And again, 85 is not a great number. You can ask the question, why is 85 and not 100? And the first answer is, we don't know. Uh, the second answer is, yeah, we wish it was better than that. The third answer is, some people waited too long. Some people are not healthy enough to recover. Um, you know, so that there's some percentage of people that we just can't help no matter what for their health issues. And some people, um, well, I said waited a long, too long already. And that's what I'm going to get to now. You don't want to wait too long. You don't want to have the nerve either die or, you know, have a stroke, the equivalent of a stroke. Um, you want to take the pressure off the nerve one way or another. And so surgery exists. We do it all the time. There's hundreds of thousands of carpal tunnels done every year in America. Uh, I do between 200 and 400 a year. Uh, and I'm one of five hand surgeons north, north or south. I'm one of something like 30 hand surgeons in Memphis. And carpal tunnel operation is not done just by hand surgeons. It's done by all different kinds of doctors. Uh, so there's lots of doctors doing carpal tunnel releases in Memphis, and there's lots of carpal tunnels getting done. I did three of them today. Um, so it is a good, good surgery. There is several different ways to skin that cat. And part of the reason why there are several different ways is because we doctors don't find 85% to be successful number. We are always looking for a new way of doing it that has a better than 85% success rate. And every once in a while, somebody invents something, he pats himself on the back, the rest of us cheer for him or her. Um, and then a couple of years later, we find out, yeah, yeah, not really, not so good. So anyway, um, there are several different options. We'll come back to that. Uh, natural course. I think I already mentioned that living with is not a good decision because the nerve can die. The nerve is literally suffocating. It's not getting enough oxygen. Uh, it can become reversible damaged. Um, as it starts to fail, you know, we call it the nerve, like it's one structure. And by the naked eye, it's one structure. But if you were to take out a high power microscope and look at it, you see there's actually about a billion little nervelets all running together, almost like a telephone wire. If you ever look at a telephone wire, there's a bunch of little wires inside of it. Uh, and each one of those is an individual. Each one of those has their own purposes, their own strengths, their own weaknesses. And if you crush the structure long enough that it starts to die, each one of them dies at their own rate. Uh, for whatever reason, the sensory nerves get sick first, but they die last. The motor nerves get sick last, but they die first. Uh, and, and so anyway, once the motor nerves become involved, that's when we say, oh, well, hold on, hold on now. Uh, if you let this go much further, then that nerve is going to die. Uh, and so the first sign of the motor nerve going bad that a normal person can see is this muscle right here on your thumb. It'll start to shake and shiver every once in a while. You'll actually see it almost like a little spasm. Uh, that's a bad indicator. And then it starts to starts to thin. It gets thinner and thinner and thinner. That's a really bad indicator. And if it gets to the point where there's no muscle there at all, that's a terrible indicator. That, that promises the nerve is dead. Um, as the nerve fails, that portion of it that's failed doesn't get better. The portion of it that's getting ready to fail is what gets better. Um, so you get permanent weakness, you get permanent numbness if you wait too long. Um, surgical options. I was gonna mention this a minute ago. So again, there's lots of different ways of skinning this cat. Um, the carpal tunnel itself actually goes from about here in the middle of your palm to about here, about two inches below your, your, your wrist is when it starts to come you know, in like a funnel. So as originally described by a neurosurgeon, uh, you make an incision across the entire length of the carpal tunnel. You take this whole thing and open it all up and, and make sure the nerve is under pressure. That's a historical thing. Almost nobody does that anymore. Only times that you do something like that is when it's more than just carpal tunnel. Like there's a dislocated wrist as well as a carpal tunnel. The dislocated wrist is causing the carpal tunnel. You do the carpal tunnel and while you're in there, you all take care of the dislocated wrist. Uh, or if there's a tumor, which happens occasionally, or if there's an infection in the carpal tunnel, which happens rarely, but does happen. Uh, for those, you make it make a big incision. Uh, over time, as our techniques evolved, the incisions got smaller and smaller and smaller, which is generally speaking good. Generally speaking, that means less pain. Um, and so since that generally speaking is true, uh, many of us thought absolutely speaking would be true too. If you got down to the point where you had basically no incision, you should have basically no pain. And so so there were two doctors in particular in the country uh, who invented the idea of making a little stab hole and sticking a camera in there and through the camera, sticking a knife in there and decompressing your carpal tunnel. And as anybody who's watched Dr. Cole's thing, Dr. Cole's a big fan of that operation. And I love Dr. Cole for that. And I think he does a great job with that operation. At the same point, when I was in the middle of my training, a study came out and, and the study kind of sort of pulled the chair out underneath people who are doing scopes. And the study showed that despite what people thought and what people had said before, there really was not a significant improvement 
with doing it endoscopically versus doing it open. And in fact, the study went on to say, those doctors, we doctors tend to kind of sort of pat ourselves on the back and think what a great operation this is. Um, and some of us do the operation, we probably shouldn't. Um, and the study showed that the complication rate was much higher uh, with endoscopic than with open, unless your surgeon had done more than 500. By the time the surgeon had done more than 500, the risk profile came close to being what it was before, but still worse. In fact, cutting the nerve, which, you know, knock on wood, uh, doesn't happen very often, uh, but mistakenly cutting the nerve happens four times as often with the scope than with an incision, four times. Uh, and so knowing that information and being, as I mentioned, the third child of a six child family and, and never wanting to roll anybody's ruffles, um, I decided back then that I was not going to do endoscopic. I was not going to hurt people to get to the 500 level. Um, and there are people who, who need it, who it's the right operation, in which case I say, you know what, I've got a couple of partners, including Jeff Cole, who do this all the time. They have done a lot more than 500 of them. Go see him. On the other hand, the, the average majority patient, uh, I think that there is nothing superior about doing an endoscopic. I can make my scar look nicer than the endoscopic portal typically. I can do a decompression better. Um, I can charge you less money because it doesn't involve very expensive equipment, which endoscopic does. Um, and interestingly, as the scars got smaller and smaller and smaller, if you control for everything else, we found out that actually the pain doesn't get less. Um, and I think the reason for that is because I think the majority of the pain, particularly that which happens you know, beyond two or three days after surgery, is not because you put an incision in the skin. It's because you cut the roof of the carpal tunnel, which is how we decompress it. And no matter how you get to the carpal tunnel, when you do that operation, you're cutting the roof. So I really do think that fundamentally that's the source of pain beyond this, beyond the second or third day. Um, and studies support that. Studies show that the pain is the same the first day. The second day, there's a little tiny bit less pain with endoscopic than there was with open. By the third day, it's equal. Similarly, the, one of the other claims about endoscopic originally was they go back to work faster. Well, studies don't support that. Studies show that people who actually work with their hands for a living, the return to work is the same, endoscopic versus open. That's once you control. Part of the problem is the original study, the doctor picked the people he was going to do open on, and he picked the people he was going to do closed on, and they supported what he wanted to show, that endoscopic was faster. faster. If we look at the endoscopic versus the open, the people who got the endoscopic had less severe symptoms, had less hard jobs, were better educated, understood better. The people that open are all the opposites. So yeah, of course, if you pick your people, you're going to see what you want to see. So one of the rules of science is you don't. The guy who's doing the study doesn't get to pick the people. <laughs> A computer picks them randomly, uh, or you know you roll the dice or something like that. You pick them randomly, uh, and then once you pick them randomly, you don't actually analyze your data until you go and you analyze your population first. And you make sure that you successfully randomized. If you didn't successfully randomize, that's not a valid study. So anyway, when you successfully randomize carpal tunnel open versus endoscopic, the data does not support the idea that they go back to work faster or that they have less pain. And the data does clearly show that they have more complications. So again, there's nothing wrong with endoscopic. I think that if it's something that you do 10 times a week and you've been doing 10 times a week for 30 years, you know, that's fine. Um, and so I have sent patients to Dr. Cole. I've sent patients to a, one or two of the other doctors doing endoscopic in the past. When I'm the best example I can think of without violating anybody's HIPAA, uh, I had a patient once who was a single mom, three kids, full time work job as a personal trainer. Um, for her, I mean, number one, she had two children under the age of three, diapers and toiletry stuff. Um, I, I thought the the um, the palm being intact. Uh, without an incision in the palm and therefore no risk of infection if toilet stuff got on her palm. Um, you know, so for that kind of person, I think that endoscopic is probably better. But for the average person, I really don't. Um, if I were to have mine done, I'd have mine done many open. Um, and that's what I do. There is also a, a further evolution to this. Um, there's a Canadian doctor, uh, believe it or not, uh, whose name is Alond. One of the rules of medicine that we all learned going through training is that epinephrine can be mixed in lots of things. And epinephrine 
has some beneficial side effects when you mix it with things. So it's very common to mix epinephrine with our local anesthetic, our Novocaine. Uh, and when we do that, you get more numb and you, the numbness lasts much longer. However, somebody noted back in the 50s that when you put Novocaine with epinephrine in fingers, toes, ears, or nose, nice little rhyme, fingers, toes, ears, or nose, there was a tendency for those fingers, toes, ears, and noses to just shrivel up and die. Uh, and so for years and years and years, we were all told and we all believe and we all learned that you cannot put epinephrine in your Novocaine if it's anywhere near a finger, toe, ear, or nose. And this Dr. Lawn one day said, why? And, you know, everyone said, well, look what happened in the 50s. And he said, yeah, but that was the 50s. Uh, you look and you see dentists do it all the time. Uh, and they don't have a problem. Now, that's a tooth, but they don't have any problems. Um, so he started studying. He sat down, did a scientific study, and he, you know, used dogs and cats and rabbits and stuff like that at first. Um, and he happened to meet a Swiss neurosurgeon. It's a small world. Swiss neurosurgeon who was having the same kind of thoughts as him. Together, they formed a foundation and they studied wide awake surgery. Uh, and they did this between 20 and 15 years ago. And they very definitively showed a number of very interesting things. And even though they showed it scientifically, most of us in America were like, that guy's crazy. He's, he's crazy. There's no way I'm doing that to my patients. And so over time, they proved it more and more and more. Um, and so I, I'm a convert. I believe in wide awake surgery. Uh, I pick my cases carefully. I do about a third of my carpal tunnels wide awake. Uh, I give patients the option. I tell them that, you know, hey, if you want to be wide awake, I can successfully achieve complete numbness. Um, in fact, it's better numbness than when you're asleep. And in fact, it's longer lasting numbness when you fall asleep. And Dr. Lalonde's study showed that patients are more satisfied. Uh, they don't get hungover. They don't get nauseated. They don't, they don't vomit. They don't get constipated. And some percentage of people who go to sleep, they're going to do something stupid the next day or two because their brain's not quite working. The best example I have, I've had literally patients who decided to go to the bathroom and tripped and fell over their own feet and their hand went right into a toilet. You know, that kind of thing happens when someone goes, has general anesthesia. Uh, not often, but it happens. If the person wide awake doesn't happen because their brain works fine they, 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 they never they don't have any loss of thought process um again pick a patient's carefully because you, you have to be wide awake you, you can't be wide awake plus have sedation it's it's wide awake or it's sedation there's there's no in between um and those people do great and not only that because the novocaine lasts longer uh they actually have less pain uh, and they have less use of pain medication and as I mentioned earlier, we've discovered the past 10 years that we were wrong 20 years ago when we gave people huge amounts of pain medication anytime they wanted or we felt they needed it. And we thought, why not? You know, why, why do you want someone to be in pain? The answer is because this stuff is bad for people. People die from pain medication every day. Last year, according to the federal studies, 300 people died every day from pain medication in America. America is 5% of the world's population. We use 92% of the world's pain medication as of last year. Um, so anyway, wide awake, the Novocaine lasts longer. There's less need to use pain medication. So that's the most recent thing. I, and I don't know anybody who does endoscopic uh, wide awake. I don't think you can. Uh, I think it's too much, too dangerous. You're taking a camera and putting it in a small space. And if they move at all, you're just going to tear things up. So everyone I know who does endoscopic people go, go, go to sleep. Um, and that's a potential problem. I've mentioned all this stuff already and open versus endoscopic. Uh, I've talked about this. The anxiety can be an issue. I didn't actually talk about that. You do have to be able to be calm and just sit there you're, you know, it's a screen, you can't see what I'm doing. You're talking to a nurse who's saying in your head, whose job is just to sit there and entertain you and to make sure you're okay. Um, can't move your fingers when I'm doing it. Uh, but really it's, it's a very good option for those people. Um, here's another example. The whole wide awake concept has been expanded to lots of other operations, including trigger finger release to queer veins release, which are operations on your hand and wrist, tendon repairs, uh, Dr. Lalonde has done a lot of studies there. He shows the result is actually better because the patient can then say, hey, you can say, hey, make a fist. And you can see if the tendon works where well, you can't do that when they're asleep. Um, finger fractures, some finger fractures we can fix with people wide awake. 
Uh, and then I mentioned RTI is one of my favorite operations. Uh, Dr. Lalonde does RTI is wide awake and he does something interesting. I also hinted at this already. I mentioned that I don't really just do a simple excision anymore, or I never did. I don't know anybody who does except for Dr. Lalonde. Dr. Lalonde, who invented the wide awake procedure, has this idea where he takes it out and he sticks his finger in where the bone used to be and he does not make a fist. Uh, and if when he makes a fist, his finger gets pitched, that to him means you got to do something to stabilize it. If the finger doesn't get pinched, he doesn't think you need to stabilize it at all because it's already stable. And it's a very intriguing idea. I think it's awesome. At the same point, I'm really scared um, that it might not work and I might have a horribly painful, miserable patient. So I have never done an LRTI wide awake. I'm not sure if I will. Um, there's got to be a lot more data that it works for me, for me to do it. Uh, but if it shown to be work and I could get over my, my fear um, that I'd be hurting people, I think it'd be great because I, if I can keep people numb for 30 hours, like I can with a wide awake carpal tunnel, that would be awesome. And not have people take pain medication for the first you know two days, that would be awesome. Uh, but again, I, to me, it's, it's more of a, hey, I'd love to do this, but I'm too afraid to do it. This is a great example of what we do though. Though This is a young lady uh, who had, had her first day at a, at a new job, uh, cut her finger on a knife and, and she cut her flexor tendon. That structure in the middle between the two metallic things is her flexor tendon. That's a structure that you know attaches the muscle in your, in your forearm to the fingertip and, and through it, like a, like a playing tug of war, uh, bends your finger. You actually have two in every finger. They're double stacked like a double decker bus. Uh, but you're looking down into that wound, little tiny wound, what, which I did wide awake. And, and was able to get the pieces to come together and put a couple stitches in it. And she did awesome. Um, again, I do think wide awake offers lots of, lots of, lots of potential improvements. And she, she was able to med bend her finger and make a fist so I could see whether it was perfect or not perfect. And I was able to make it perfect. Um, so in summary, um, Modern medicine, we, we, we're not perfect. We remain imperfect. We're getting better and better and better. We're always trying to learn. Uh, we're always trying to make improvements. Um, there are many different options and each of them have merit. Uh, what's most important, I think, and what, what the American Academy of Hand Surgery and American Society of Hand Surgery think, is the route to excellence. The surgeon All righty, I apologize, Dr. Fahey, my computer froze there. Have you wrapped up? Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm at the end. I'm sorry it took so long. I got, I got to take uh, out of control, I suppose. I'll be done in about five minutes, maybe less. Yes, um, sir. Um, so I'm also, I'm skip this. My mom's a nurse, and my mom being a nurse really formed me. Uh, I always try to think in terms of the whole patient rather than just the broken part or the part, and that requires that I get to know you, listen to you, and respect you. And I'm not afraid of being asked questions. Um, and so I'm more than happy to answer them. Uh, in that context, I have here a slide that we can make available to everybody else. These are some websites, uh, mostly run by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery that supports everything that I've said. Um, and that's a picture of my family. Um, and that's the end of my, my speech. All righty, everyone. Thank you for sticking around. And Dr. Fahey, thank you for that presentation. I know I learned a lot and a lot of things I wasn't expecting to learn tonight. I'm going to give everyone a quick second to submit any questions if they have any. And I'm also going to put my email address in the chat. If you would like to email me a question, I'll pass them along to Dr. Fahey. All righty. My email is S-N-U-C-H-O-L-S at orthosouth.org. Um, we don't really have any questions right now. So I'm gonna give everyone just a quick second to get that jotted down and I think we will be done for the evening. 
All righty. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahey. Y'all all have a good night.